Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. This is Stephanie Bradley. I'm the director of the Epicenter, which stands for the Evidence-Based Prevention and Intervention Support Center. Um, welcome to our webinar on fighting the opioid epidemic through prevention. This is the uh, one in several of a series of webinars using PAYS data. Um, as part of this webinar today, we have joining us Janine Burris, who's a prevention coordinator here at Epicenter, who supports community-based prevention programs here at Epis. We have Heather Roberts, who's also a prevention coordinator at Epicenter, and she supports uh, school-based programs here at Epicenter. And we also have Jeff Colchin, who is the program manager at the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. So it's our pleasure to have uh, you all here with us this morning to uh, tune in to this very important issue. Um, we know that in Pennsylvania, there is an opioid overdose epidemic going on and that the Commonwealth has one of the highest rates of overdose in the country. Uh, so there is quite a lot being done uh, across the state in terms of treatment as well as prescribing practices and other policies going into place. Um, and one of the things that we've recognized is that we um, it, it need to work upstream on this issue. And so upstream for us is really looking at preventive practices, uh, specifically around equipping youth and parents to reduce youth risk uh, for uh, opioid use and misuse. So today's webinar, we're going to be focusing on um, how we can address this, this issue for youth and adolescents. We'll be looking at Pennsylvania data on youth risk, as well as to, uh, discussing effective strategies for using data and for uh, addressing these risks. Um, so welcome, and I'm going to uh, pass the microphone over to Heather, who has a couple of important uh, things to say about how we're going to move through this webinar. Thanks, Steph. Um, just some important reminders. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded. Uh, our full presentation, as well as uh, the PowerPoint slides, will be available on the Epicenter website uh, within the next week or two. Uh, also, when our webinar has ended today, there will be a brief survey that will launch in your web browser. We would really appreciate your feedback. Um, as that helps us to improve uh, future webinars. Uh, and the survey should only take a few minutes to complete. Uh, we know that some of you in attendance today may have heard about this webinar from a colleague. Um, and so if you're not currently getting emails from the, web, the Epicenter directly and you find today's webinar valuable, uh, we'd love to add you to our mailing list. Uh, so whether you choose to fill out the survey at the end um, or not, you'll still be able to use that web page that pops up to share your email with us. As you can see today, uh, we are completing the last of the PAYS webinar series. Um, and so all four of the webinars will be available on our website soon. Today's topics that we're going to cover are PAYS data and what it tells us about opioid use, uh, best practices in prevention, and specific prevention programs. Uh, today's webinar is going to be focusing around youth and adolescents. And first, Jeff is going to discuss the PAYS data with us. Great. Thank you, Heather. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, this is, a, as Stephanie mentioned, a very important topic. Uh, my name is Jeff Colchin. I am a program manager with the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, and I also serve as the project leader for the Pennsylvania Youth Survey, the PAYS. Uh, one of the, the things that PAYS is essential for here in Pennsylvania is it serves as the foundation for PCCD's public health approach uh, to addressing substance abuse uh, prevention. Uh, PCCD has been using this public health approach as the basis of our prevention strategy since the mid-1990s. And the premise of it is that you collect data and use that data to drive the decisions about what programs would be most appropriate to address local issues. So my uh, presentation is going to give a, a brief overview uh, of, of some of the results of the PAYS data, which was last administered in the fall of 2015. Uh, PAYS is given every other year since 1989 to students in the 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th grades. Uh, among other things, it looks at, at two levels of use. Uh, PAYS looks at uh, lifetime use and 30-day use of a variety of substances. 
Uh, when you're looking at lifetime use, it basically shows the level of experimentation. How many kids are trying a substance at some point uh, in, the, in their academic careers? 30-day use, on the other hand, shows ongoing use or abuse of these substances. And obviously, both of those will take a, a different uh, approach in prevention uh, to address and offset some of those uh, use of a variety of substances. This chart will show you the lifetime uh, substance use by gender uh, for a variety of substances for which questions are included in the PAYS. As, as you would expect, the most common substances used over the lifetime of our students that they reported uh, is alcohol and marijuana. And one of the interesting things you see uh, that jumped out to us when we began analyzing these 2015 results, more females than males actually report using alcohol in their lifetime. Whereas with marijuana, a slightly larger number of males than females report using that substance at some point in their life. Looking at uh, prescription narcotic drugs, uh, that are prescribed, that are, are give, that are used by students without a prescription. This is not drugs that are prescribed by a doctor for an injury or surgery or anything else. These are drugs that are used uh, on a recreational basis. We are seeing a, a uh, lifetime use of these substances between 6 and 7% for, for males and females, a relatively low number. Um, and then also, interest, interestingly, uh, heroin is really not an issue for our students as they report. We're seeing less than 1% of students across all, all four grades reporting using heroin in their lifetime, with the highest level of use in their lifetime of 1.9% of 12th grade boys. Moving to the most frequently used substances over the past 30 days, again, you can see that alcohol and marijuana are, are relatively uh, high rates of use. And something that jumped out this year, we added questions around the use of e-cigarettes and vaping. Uh, and we're seeing a very high level of use of those substances, especially among males in Pennsylvania. And the use of those of, of electronic cigarettes, hookahs, those sorts of, uh, of items is much higher than the national uh, peers, what, what is being reported through the Monitoring the Future Survey. So this is an area moving forward that we will have to work to address in Pennsylvania. But again, looking at the opioids and heroin, we're seeing very low uh, lifetime use. For opioids, 1.7% of boys and 2.2% of girls reported using uh, narcotic prescriptions, narcotic drugs without a prescription. And again, heroin is extremely low, between 0.1 and 0.2% uh, of of students reported using that substance in the last 30 days. Specifically looking at the use of narcotics, you're seeing the highest lifetime use uh, among 12th graders with 12.1% of those students reporting using narcotics without a prescription. This is the same in 2013 and 2015. And as you can see, is about 50% higher than the peers at the national level, level, again, judged by the monitoring the future. So here in Pennsylvania, our students are using these substances more than they are at the national level. That is also true across all the grades. Where we have the comparisons in 8th, 10th, and 12th, Pennsylvania students are reporting higher than their national peers. Switching to the 30-day use of prescription narcotics, uh, we are again seeing 12th graders being the highest at 3% using those substances recreationally over the last 30 days, which is again higher than the national average. Beginning in 2015, the, the PAYS began to collect information about the sources. If students use prescription drugs without a, a doctor's prescription, where did they obtain those, those narcotics? We're seeing for sixth graders that uh, over 50%, 52.9% are reporting taking those pills from their home, from a family member that had a, a prescription. Uh, it may be for a surgery or an injury where they did not, they did not finish the entire prescription. And instead of safely disposing of those, those pills, they were left in the home and students were taking them and using them recreationally. So this shows, again, the need for us to use education among parents to dispose of these in a safe manner. Uh, there is a series of, of what's known as drug take-back boxes, which are being proliferated throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, there's more information from the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs on their website about the location of those sites. And we would encourage uh, anyone that's interested in this issue to, to get the, the word out about the need to safely dispose of these, these substances, these pills, so that they are not used recreational by our students. 
looking at our 12th graders, 12th graders are reporting the two most uh, common ways of, of getting the substances are either, either being given those pills, uh, that could be from a family member or a friend, or buying them. Uh, with 36.5% 30, uh, of students report, reporting buying those substances. It is interesting to note that the level of ordering them online is very low. That kind of goes against the common wisdom that it's very easy for students to go simply go online and purchase these pills. Our students are not telling us that that is where they're obtaining them. Either They're either taking them from their home or getting them from someone that they know. We also want to look at the ease of access. If a student wanted to get a, a uh, narcotic pain pill without a prescription, how easy would it be for them to do so? We are seeing 43% uh, of our 12th graders are reporting that they could, they could easily or sort of easily obtain a, these prescription narcotics uh, from a, a source that they know. And this is a, uh, the 43% is a huge jump from uh, the 2013 pays when only 36.9. So we are seeing an ease of access uh, in obtaining these substances. And if you compare the 2013 to 2015 results, you can see that that, that ease of access has gone up in every single grade, make, meaning that there is, these are, are more, uh, more available and kids are knowing where they can obtain them if they really wanted to, to use the, those substances without a prescription. Looking at the perception of peer disapproval, uh, if, uh, if, if, if a student used the, the uh, narcotics without, uh, without a doctor's prescription, what would their peers think of them? Uh, the number of, of students that reported that it would be wrong or that their friends would think it was wrong or very wrong uh, is shown here. When you look at sixth graders, 92.5% said that their friends would think it was wrong. But unfortunately, that number drops all the way down to 77.4% for our seniors. Only 77.4% of them said that their friends would think it was wrong if they used narcotics without a prescription. Uh, again, an area for education about the dangers of, of these substances, which leads us into the next question on uh, prescription drugs that's included in the PAYS data. The perception of risk. If you use prescription, if you use prescription narcotics without a doctor's note, how dangerous is it? The percentage of our students reporting a moderate risk or great risk uh, is relatively high at, our, at the, uh, the 12th grade level, with 82.9% saying that they, there is a great or moderate level of risk in using those without a doctor's note. However, looking at our sixth graders, we're seeing a, a lower level. Only 77.7% .7 of them said that there is a risk in using those substances. So there's a, a, a opportunity for education at, the, at the, early, the early grades, the elementary, the middle school grades about the dangers of these substances, increasing the awareness of the risk of using these while not being under a doctor's care. The other interesting and somewhat scary fact is that the level, the perception of risk has dropped in every grade from 2013 to 2015. So we again are seeing our students uh, uh, reducing their, the, the, the fear or the, the lack of willingness to try due to the, the fear of the risk of those substances. I'm going to turn that over to, back over to Heather now, and she's going to walk us through one of the main things of our public health approach. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, the Social Development Strategy, or SDS, was developed by world-renowned prevention researcher Dr. David Hawkins and Dr. Richard Catalano at the Social Development Research Group at the University of Washington and is one of the foundations of proven effective prevention science. The SDS organizes what researchers have discovered about protective factors that are measured in the PAYS into a model of social development that pinpoints the critical elements and processes leading to positive youth development. One of the chief elements is the process called bonding. The social development strategy acknowledges that human beings are hardwired for group involvement and interaction. So it doesn't matter whether that group is the school drama club, friends who do drugs, or the local gang, young people will affiliate themselves with and adopt the standards of the group that offers the strongest incentives and the greatest psychological rewards. This bonding process is the element that plays the most significant part in determining whether young people will develop in a healthy, positive way. Now we're going to view a short video that has Dr. Hawkins discussing the, the social development strategy 
and how we can all implement it in our daily lives. Protective factors increase the probability of healthy behaviors and success among young people. Now, some of these protective factors are things that young people are born with, like a resilient temperament. Some are skills for social interaction or for self-control that children can learn. And other protective factors are things that adults in the community can do in their day-to-day -day interactions to promote protection among young people. We've organized the protective factors into a strategy for action that we call the social development strategy. The social development strategy is as simple as five fingers on one hand. If you want to increase healthy behaviors among young people, the first thing you need to do is provide opportunities, developmentally appropriate opportunities for active involvement. Nate got to feed the gerbil. When a mom picks up an infant, that's an opportunity for active involvement. When people ask the eighth graders in the middle school, what equipment do you think we should put on the new playground? That's an opportunity for involvement. The second element of the social development strategy is skills. Young people need the skills to be successful in the opportunities they have. Nate needed to learn the skill of watering the gerbil as well as feeding the gerbil. The third element of the social development strategy is recognition. Providing recognition to young people for improvement, for effort, and for achievement. In Nate's case, the teacher recognized him and the class recognized him with applause. Recognition is important because it leads to the fourth element of the social development strategy, which is bonding. A sense of emotional attachment and closeness to the people who've provided those opportunities, skills, and recognition. Nate felt better about his school, his class, his teacher, as a result of opportunity, skills, and recognition. He felt more bonded. Bonding is important because it provides the motivation to live according to the fifth element of the social development strategy, which is healthy beliefs and clear standards for behavior. In Nate's classroom, because he felt bonded to his teacher and to his class, he followed the standard of doing his homework that weekend. Opportunities, skills, recognition, build bonding. Bonding provides the motivation to live according to the standards offered by that group. Keep in mind that opportunities, skills, and recognition need to be provided in a way that recognizes individual children's differences and cultural differences. The social development strategy has been tested. It works. When teachers and parents during the elementary grades apply it to young people's lives, we find that years later, they're more academically successful in school, they are doing better economically, and they have less heavy alcohol use, less violence, fewer of them have been pregnant as teenagers, and they have fewer mental health problems well into their 20s, years after they experienced the social development strategy. So how can you use the social development strategy to make positive changes for the kids in your community? The thing that we're trying to get at with the social development strategy is that there are um, a, a number of risk and protective factors across multiple domains that uh, influence uh, a youth developing towards healthy behaviors. So um, providing opportunities for pro-social involvement, um, uh, which can include um, volunteering or, or playing a leadership role in a classroom, providing supportive skills to um, support those opportunities for that youth to um, really take advantage of that opportunity, as well as recognizing when youth are um, doing well with taking advantage of that opportunity and using skills, um, all lead to essentially bonding in these different environments. And that once those opportunity skills and recognition lead to bonding, um, then you have a, a greater likelihood that that youth is going to adhere to the standards that are put forward by that group. And that, that ultimately leads to healthy behaviors uh, for that youth. So um, this is sort of what the social development strategy is organized around. The PACE, uh, PACE data measures um, some of these characteristics and, and Jeff will, I think, talk about that now. 
Thanks, Stephanie. Sure. As I mentioned, the, the public health approach that, that has been the foundation here in Pennsylvania is really built around this uh, social development strategy. The idea of, of really helping our kids uh, develop the skills to succeed in life. And an essential part of that is being recognized when they do well, when they engage in pro-social behaviors. And one of the, the great things about the, the Pennsylvania Youth Survey is it does contain the surveillance data, some of which I showed you at the beginning of the uh, my part of the presentation, but it provides the risk and protective factors. And the, this, the idea of the concept of this is that risk factors increase the likelihood of a kid engaging in problem behaviors later in life, and protective factors provide a buffer, either people in their community, their, their friends, their mentors, their parents, or conditions, having opportunities to do positive things and get, instead of getting in trouble or engaging in negative behaviors such as ATOD abuse, um, other, other issues like that. And to protect, by building up the protective factors, they can be used to address, to address some of the risk factors and offset that risk, reducing the number of kids and the likelihood that they're going to engage in these problem behaviors. What you see on this chart here is the, the theoretical concept behind risk and protective factors. On the left-hand side, you see the risk factor matrix. Uh, going down the left-hand side are all the risk factors that are collected in the Pennsylvania Youth Survey, and they fall into four domains, the community domain, the family domain, the school domain, and what we call the peer or individual domain, the, the self factors and uh, factors that uh, come from uh, relations between uh, kids and their friends. Um, and across the top, you see a variety of problem behaviors. Uh, substance abuse, delinquency, uh, teen pregnancy, school dropout, violence, and then depression and anxiety. Everywhere you see a check mark, it means there's been a minimum of two, two uh, uh, theoretical studies that have been conducted that have shown a direct relation, a direct relation between the existence of a risk factor and the higher likelihood of a student engaging in the uh, problem behavior. So where uh, you collect your, your local data uh, and we at the state collect our data and is to figure out what the highest level of risk is and select programming to address those risks, which the second part of our presentation today will deal with. Similarly, on the right-hand side, you can see the protective factor matrix. Again, the four domains, um, and then you can see uh, the social development strategy, strategy across the top. So you want to increase the level of protection and decrease the level of risk. The, the great thing about this risk and protective factor model is that you're getting at the underlying causes of the problem behavior. Rather than just focusing on, we think that, enough, that our kids are binge drinking or we think our kids are, are engaging in smoking marijuana at earlier ages. You wanna find out why they're doing that. And again, develop protections to prevent them from engaging in those behaviors and reduce the level of risk that can lead them into, into uh, potentially uh, engaging in those behaviors. So to give you an idea as to, to uh, what this is uh, like in concept, here's a summary of the, the Pennsylvania State Risk and Protective Factors. Uh, this information, uh, the last two slides are available to be downloaded through the, the, uh, uh, the, the link on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and the state report is also available out on the PAYS website uh, for you, you to download the PDF version. It's www.pays.pa.gov. For the risk factors, the two highest risk factors that we see at the state level uh, that we at this, at, as uh, uh, PCCD are working to, to address um, through policies and the variety of programs that we fund are parental attitudes favorable towards antisocial behavior, 46% of our students reported that being a risk factor for them, and a perceived risk for drug use, uh, which relates back to what we saw in the, uh, the prior slides about the perception of risk. Again, 46% of our students are reporting that that is a risk factor for them. Uh, similarly, on the right-hand side, you can see the protective factors. Uh, and the, the great thing that we're seeing here is that the three highest protective factors that our students in Pennsylvania are reporting are all in the family domain. Our kids are getting a lot of support from their families, which means if we can strengthen the supports for families, educate our parents and other caregivers as to what the dangers their, their kids are being faced for faced with, we can improve the, the, the outcomes, we can improve their success in life, and we can reduce the likelihood that they're going to engage in some of the problem behaviors uh, that are mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation. So the three highest ones are family attachment, 
Kids are feeling bonded to their family. Again, the social development strategy. Uh, they're being given opportunities for pro-social involvement. There are things that they can do with their families. They uh, are uh, going out together, eating dinner together, playing games together, uh, and rewards for pro-social involvement. When they do good, the parents and other caregivers are letting them know and saying, well done. The more we can strengthen those protect, protective factors across the Commonwealth, the better the likelihood of the outcomes for our kids. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bradley and let her kind of walk us through what we call the key principles of effective prevention. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and I just wanted to make a note about the PAYS data and the risk and protective factors. And really, the, one of the key things that we want to make sure folks take away from this webinar is that while the PAYS measures prescription narcotic use and measures heroin use, um, and, and those can be important surveillance pieces of data, that we wouldn't want you to rely only on those pieces of information. We expect those rates to be low for kids who are in 6th to 12th grades. That's pretty normal for those rates to be low. Um, but we don't want to say then, then everything is fine. What we want to look at is these risk and protective factors to make sure that we are getting at the, the issues that drive potentially problem behaviors. So we know that um, really uh, age of first use of heroin, those types of things tend to happen once kids are getting out of school. But we want to look at these risk and protective factors before they get out of school and move, move on. So that's kind of the idea between the, b behind the PAYS data. Um, so in, in looking through that data then, um, you know, we, we understand that there are some risks around uh, attitudes towards substance use, uh, both with parents and with youth. And we may be looking to find programs and practices to address some of those issues. Um, with, the, with the opioid issue in particular, we've been seeing uh, a lot of interest in adopting programs and developing programs and finding things that work. So we think it's important to highlight today uh, the things that we have identified through uh, decades of research and prevention around, around what works around addressing uh, youth risk for substances as well as other issues highlighted in the, uh, the, the risk and protective factor uh, matrix that Jeff shared. So um, in terms of programming, uh, it's, it's essential that programs address knowledge, beliefs and attitudes and norms, as well as skills and that all three of these pieces really need to be in place for a program to be effective. So the knowledge component would really be about learning, um, learning some facts around, for example, uh, the impact that opioids have on the body, the, the physiological effects, the, uh, maybe the, the, yeah, the impacts that, the, that that substance might have with other substances. Um, we also want to clarify norms about the prevalence of problem behaviors, such as this op opioid use. So we have the PAYS data, the 30 use data shows um, anywhere between 1% to 3% of, of youth having used prescription narcotics uh, recently. So we can share that data back with kids and say, hey, no, really not everybody is using it, and in fact not many people are using it at all. Um, and then we would want to, in that program, work on changing youth attitudes around the acceptability of, of opioid use. So understanding sort of developing positive norms around not using, not misusing those drugs, um, that type of a thing. And so that gets at the beliefs, attitudes, and norms. And then third, looking at helping the youth develop skills for resisting use, for staying out of circumstances that might be risky, as well as identifying ways to get out of situations of risk. And so um, when you bring all three of these pieces together, you have a strong program that's going to address all of the needs that that youth have in terms of really being able to effectively respond to scenarios of risk. Um, and I, I sort of refer to this as the trifecta of prevention. Um, and, and, not, and so the other thing I wanted to say about that is that no single one of those alone is enough. It's not just enough to know about the issues. It's not just enough to correct no understanding of norms. And it's not just enough to have skills. They all three need to come together. Uh, okay, so other things that work in prevention. Using a strengths-based approach. This is really around um, framing things in a positive, identifying um, the strengths that the youth may have, uh, either in themselves or within their peer network or their family, and helping them build on those strengths. Um, and this is really in contrast to highlighting all the ways that they may be vulnerable um, and weaknesses that they might have, So, uh, or providing them with a list of all the things that they should not do. Those are not really effective at um, building up strength and resilience in the youth. 
Um, so we really look for programs to have a strength, strengths-based orientation. Um, of course, we know that youth develop uh, in multiple contexts. We've seen that in the risk and protective factor data and uh, programming that is most likely to be effective ad addresses this issue that, that kids um, you know, have their own sort of characteristics to deal with. They have characteristics of the friends that they hang out with and the peers that they're surrounded by. Um, they are developing with their family and their family system, whether that's single parents or uh, uh, siblings, those types of things. Um, as well as uh, they're in school most days, they have a community that they're in. And so when programs attend to risk and protection across those different levels, that's going to create a strong program and create is more likely to create positive uh, uh, impacts for, the, for youth. Um, the last couple of things here uh, include that programs really need to be interactive and hands-on, provide a lot of opportunity for kids to work with their peers and to work with pro-social positive adults, to practice skills, to try on uh, different ideas, to uh, role play certain scenarios. Um, and that really gives them an opportunity to sort of work through that content and to build, um, in some cases, skills that are, that are needed are sort of complex skills or, or situations that are complex to be in. Um, and that corresponds pretty closely with a uh, program really needing enough time to have impact. So usually because these are sort of complex developmental skills that we're trying to build in youth, we want to make sure that we actually give them enough opportunity to work through material, to practice at home, to practice it with friends, so on and so forth. Um, so those are some characteristics of what works in prevention. I wanted to highlight that we do have a resource in the file share component of the Adobe space. I believe it's this first one listed here, it starts with effective prevention. So we have more detail on characteristic, characteristics of what works, as well as uh, things that don't work, and also some case studies around um, specific programs uh, that have been shown to work and to not work. So moving into ineffective approaches, um, we see a lot particularly related to the opioid uh, overdose issue, we see a lot of draw towards um, programs that highlight uh, danger and deterrence. And uh, we have decades of research that actually show that danger and deterrence approaches are not effective. Um, they typically do not reduce youth, youth risk uh, and in some cases have actually increased youth risk. And so when we're talking about danger and deterrence, what we're talking about is sort of sharing of, um, you know, terrible stories of personal experience or could be testimonies from somebody recovering from addiction, could be reenactments of uh, jail scenes or arrest scenes or overdose scenes, um, as well as things like tours of jails and boot camps. These, are, these all have this sort of danger and deterrence approach to them. Um, sometimes they're called scare tactic ap approaches as well. Um, and this is really what we're talking about when we're talking about that type of approach. Uh, so one of the reasons, there, there are several reasons why these approaches aren't effective. Um, one of which is, is uh, really rests in adolescent brain development. So the part of the brain in adolescence that is interested in risk taking and sensation seeking and novelty is growing at a much faster rate than the part of the brain that is responsi responsible for future planning, for impulse control, and decision making. So this is what's, what we're sh showing in this slide here is this red curved line is that, is that part of the brain that's growing very quickly, that's very interested in novelty and risk taking. And the blue line sort of growing more gradually there is that impulse control part of the system. So you can see that um, that, that sort of sensation-seeking part of the brain is growing much more quickly. So when we are exposing youth to programs that show them risky scenarios, that show them very dramatic scenes, you may really be piquing their curiosity from this part of their brain that's growing much more quickly than the part of the brain that uh, we would want to rely on using that program, which is the part of the brain that says, I shouldn't engage in this behavior, this behavior is bad, those types of things. That part of the brain we can't rely on during adolescence. So this is one of the reasons that we um, really strongly recommend to not use that danger and deterrence approach because there is a lot of potential to um, tap into this sensation peak seeking part of the brain without being able to rely on the control part of the brain. Um, and there are a lot of other more effective uh, strategies out there. So moving on, we do have a couple of other types of approaches that are not necessarily harmful, but 
uh, are really unlikely to have very much impact in terms of preventing youth risk. Uh, one of which is using, um, uh, you know, one-time speakers, visiting speakers, school assemblies, those types of things. Um, those approaches are more likely actually to be effective with uh, school boards or with uh, policymakers, where you have somebody coming in giving a testimony. That's effective for uh, 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 influencing adult decision making, but not for youth. Um, so. Uh, one last comment related to uh, effective programming. Uh, we, there is a resource out there that we like quite a bit, the uh, Drug-Free Action Alliance pamphlet on why scare tactics don't work. Um, you can order them online at the website listed here, or you can send an email to our Aaron Smith, um, who, uh, who can send you up to five copies. So if you'll send him your mailing address, we'll be happy to send you those out. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Heather, who is going to be talking about um, uh, an evidence-based program that works um, and is effective, and let you take it away. Thanks, Steph. Um, one of the uh, evidence-based programs that I'm going to talk to you today about is uh, Life Skills Training, or LST. Uh, this program's primary objective is to enhance the development of basic life skills, uh, personal competence, and also skills related to resistance to social influences that promote substance use. So here are, um, in front of you is the logic model or the theory of change. Um, and this shows you the, the components of LST, um, which are the lessons um, and the generalization or how to apply the skills they're learning in the lessons uh, that lead to a decrease in the risk factors and an increase in the protective factors. Um, that in turn leads to the short-term uh, outcomes, which are increased drug resistance skills and knowledge, uh, increased self-management skills, and improved social skills, um, which finally then leads to the long-term um, outcome of reduced antisocial behavior. Uh, LST is being implemented in 33 counties around the world. Um, and one more, I'm sorry, countries around the world, and one more uh, comparable school-based, evidence-based program uh, that the Epicenter supports is Project Towards No Drug Abuse. LST decreases risk factors, uh, like I said in the previous slide, uh, such as low perceived risks of drug use, uh, early initiation of drug use, sensation seeking, uh, as well as multiple other risk factors that you can see here. Uh, the program also increases the protective factors uh, listed, which are social skills and interactions with pro-social peers. The LST Middle School program um, is a universal school-based program uh, that targets all middle and junior high school students. Uh, initial intervention begins uh, in grades six or seven, uh, depending on the school structure, and then has booster sessions in the, the two subsequent years. Um, here uh, you see the sessions are, are broken down. Year one uh, would be grade six or seven, year two would be seven or eight, and grade, year three would be eight or nine. Um, so in year one, there are 15 sessions with three optional uh, sessions, which are the violence prevention, violence prevention sessions, uh, and then the, the two subsequent years, um, as you can see as well. These sessions are approximately 30 to 45 minutes uh, and can be taught either on uh, an intensive schedule uh, consecutively every day, or you could teach two to three times a week, um, or you could do more of an extended schedule, which would be maybe like once a week. Uh, this evidence-based program is very interactive and combines learning strategies uh, such as coaching, uh, peer interaction, classroom discussions, and activities within the lessons. Uh, life skills training has been successfully implemented um, by teachers, school counselors, prevention specialists, community youth educators, 
uh, police officers and other program providers. Uh, we usually typically see it taught as a health curriculum, but really it can be implemented anywhere in the school day. LST utilizes uh, interactive role plays and real life scenarios to help adolescents practice skills that will help make them good choices, help them make good choices um, about how they spend their time and navigate peer pressure. So this example here, um, uh, lesson two entitled Making Decisions um, is actually the first part um, of a lesson. Uh, students learn the three C's of effective decision making, uh, which are clarify, consider, and choose. Uh, so the example that I have here is um, clarify, you know, question may be what movie do we want to go to? Uh, consider uh, what movies haven't we seen yet? And then choose what's the best option for me. Um, and then after going to the movies, think about whether that movie was what you expected or not. Um, students then get to do scripted practice exercises using the three C's approach. Um, and then they participate in interactive role playing using the same approach. In the second part of this lesson um, titled Making Decisions, uh, students participate in an interactive demonstration of the power that peer pressure can have on making decisions. Um, and so this uh, is called the group conformity experiment. Um, here the whole class participates together um, and it demonstrates the power that two or three peers or leaders can have on group decision making. Um, it helps youth recognize what this dynamic looks like and they get the opportunity to apply the three C's of good decision making um, to help youth resist the pressure. Uh, the ultimate goals of this lesson are to uh, demonstrate how decisions are influenced by group pressures, discuss reasons why people are influenced by group members, identify everyday decisions, and describe how important decisions are made identifying a process for making decisions and resisting peer pressure. More than 30 years of science research on uh, LST or life skills training shows that the program works with a diverse range of adolescents and produces a long lasting result of up to 12 years. Uh, so even though it's, it's delivered in the middle school there are positive impacts through high school and beyond. LST is just one of the evidence-based programs that the EPA Center provides technical assistance for, um, and PCCD provides funding through grants to support implementation. So as you can see um, here on this slide, uh, there are overall positive outcomes for life skills training. Now I'm going to turn it over to Janine to talk about another evidence-based program. Thanks, Heather. Um, the other evidence-based prevention program that uh, we wanted to talk to you about today that, again, both PCCD and the Epicenter support is the Strengthening Families Program for Parents and Youth 10 to 14, or SFP 10 to 14. Um, this program is a caregiver, youth, and family skills building curriculum. As you can see from the um, program's logic model, we have reduced youth substance use, reduced youth antisocial behavior, and improved academic engagement and performance as this particular program's public health outcomes. Um, because the SFP 10 to 14 program involves both caregivers and youth, uh, participant outcomes include improved parenting skills and styles, improved youth skills and attitudes, and improved overall family relationships. Um, I wanted to note that there are other similar programs to SFP 10 to 14 currently being implemented in Pennsylvania and supported by PCCD, um, but with a more specific cultural curriculum. These include strong African-American families, and familias fortes. 
Um, it's also noted that SFP 10 to 14 is being implemented across America in all 50 states, as well as in more than 18 different countries, including the United Kingdom, Turkey, Norway, Greece, Germany, Russia, and Italy, just to name a few. As you can see, there are numerous um, risk and protective factors that the SFP 10 to 14 program addresses. Um, without going through and reading them all, because they are numerous, um, we can see that um, SFP 10 to 14 will decrease risk factors including um, negative youth and family management practices, negative peer influences, um, social the poor social and stress management skills, and poor school performance. And this particular program will increase protective factors including um, effective parent-child communication, promoting healthy beliefs and clear standards, family bonding, emotional management, and peer pressure refusal skills. It's very important to note that the SFP 10 to 14 program is a proven program to address <clears throat> excuse me, those universal skills of handling peer pressure in a positive manner, bonding with family, who are the youth's biggest supporters and protectors, and improving communication with both family and peers. These particular skill building components within the program cut across all domains of a youth environment, as mentioned previously by Dr. Bradley, the family, school, peer, and community. So the SFP 10 to 14 program um, is delivered in a community-based setting one time per week over seven consecutive weeks. Sessions are scheduled for two hours with a graduation celebration at the conclusion of the final session. Um, the structure of the sessions includes a one-hour session um, for each caregivers and youth separately, um, but running concurrently. The final one hour consists of a joint family session with both caregivers and their youth, which then build and complement on those skills and activities um, that were learned in each of the individual sessions. It's also important to note that part of the program each week um, consists of a family meal prior to the start of the sessions. This is usually a half hour in length, um, and this family meal, which will be provided by the coordinators of the program, helps to promote family bonding um, and the modeling of positive behaviors by the facilitators. The SFP 10 to 14 program is highly interactive. The sessions consist of a variety of activities, which include discussions, videos, short lectures, skills practice, learning games, and family projects. Um, at this point, I wanted to give you just a few examples of the SFP 10 to 14 curriculum to help you understand how this particular prevention program nicely addresses those previously mentioned characteristics of effective prevention programming, such as utilizing the multiple contexts, being interactive, and promoting positive interactions with peers and adults. In Youth Session 5, which is entitled Dealing with Peer Pressure, um, the youth participating in the program learn that alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs will harm them, as well as practicing skills to reduce peer pressure. After a round of compliments, the youth will discuss with the facilitators some of the things that um, youth will do to be liked, such as using drugs and alcohol. Discussion is held on, which these substance, on what these substances can do to harm them in different areas, not just physically. Afterward, this session focuses on setting up realistic pressurized situations that these youth may find themselves in with peers. Utilizing cue cards to help the youth practice during the session, they work through how to get themselves out of a negative situation. They will do this by asking questions, naming the problem, telling what could happen, and suggesting another route. This practicing of the skills with the entire group help the youth to support each other in an encouraging environment. 
during the following week's session, which is session six, peer pressure and good friends, um, additional skills for re resisting peer pressure um, are built in. Adding to the previous mapping of those asking questions through suggesting another route, the youth will learn to say their friend's name directly, look them in the eye, and state, listen to me. Then they learn to start removing themselves physically from the situation and then telling their peer to join them. Additionally, the group discusses qualities of what truly a good friend looks like. Another quick example I wanted to share with you is the family session number six, which is entitled Families and Peer Pressure. This session brings the youth and the caregivers together to watch video vignettes of caregivers and youth in different situations, such as a youth being pressured to smoke marijuana or to shoplift. And this will also show how a caregiver can help their youth handle that type of pressure situation in a positive way. There is time for the families to process how those caregivers in the vignettes helped their youth in the situations. Towards the end of the session, each family unit reviews and shares those refusal skills the youth learned in both sessions five and six. Caregivers are then able to see those skills in action and help their youth for the future. In the end, the caregivers will share a letter with their youth that they had created in their individual session, outlining the hopes and dreams that they have for them. Um, as you can see on this particular slide, we do have positive research findings with the SFP 10 to 14 program as they relate to substance use, particularly around alcohol, cigarettes, marijuana, and narcotics. Something we can also look at <clears throat> is the positive effect of combining evidence-based prevention programs. This information is found on the National Institute on Drug Abuse, or NIDA, website, and addresses research findings for those evidence-based programs being implemented via PROSPER. Um, just a few words about PROSPER. The PROSPER project delivers high-quality technical assistance to sites implementing prevention programs across Pennsylvania. Similar to those technical um, assistance that the Epicenter will provide to the PCCD funded grantees. PROSPER is associated with the Penn State Cooperative Extension. This particular slide shows a bar graph indicating the change in likelihood of prescription opioid misuse among teens in grades 12 for three different school programs when delivered alone, and then in combination with the SFP 10 to 14 program. The vertical axis shows the percent change in the likelihood of prescription opioid misuse, and the horizontal axis shows the three programs. Um, the All Stars Life Skills Training and Project Alert alone, um, and in combination with the SFP 10 to 14. What we wanted to highlight with this particular graph is that when used alone, life skills training led to a decrease about, of about 4% in the likelihood of prescription opioid misuse among 12th graders. Um, but when utilized in combination with SFP 10 to 14, that decreased to about 9%. Here we have data related to some of the PCCD funded prevention projects for 2015 to 2016. We have data on service numbers, surveyed numbers, and outcomes for the Big Brothers Big Sisters program, Project Towards No Drug, Drug Abuse, or Project TND, Life Skills Training, and SFP 10 to 14. As you can see from the outcomes of these programs, they're having a positive effect regarding Pennsylvania's youth around substance use, including decreases in their intent to use alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, um, an increase of knowledge around alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, improved peer resistance skills, and improved caregiver substance abuse rules and expectations.
So we know that these and other prevention programs can be placed on a continuum. Um, communities should consider where their pro pro any programs fall on the continuum of confidence based on its evidence or theory. Evidence-based programs have been shown to be effective in independent replications in multiple settings and have demonstrated long-term effects. It's noted that very few programs will reach this level of effectiveness and confidence. Um, looking at the other end of the continuum, however, we see a confidence that a program is harmful, meaning evaluations of the program have demonstrated negative effects on participants. I just want to talk to you a little bit about two different strategies we can use to help us identify where a program will lie on that continuum of confidence. The first strategy is to read research studies on the program being considered. Um, and while delving into this research, ask yourself, was effectiveness a dem demonstrated? Look for at least one randomized control trial or RCT. Also ask yourself, were large studies done with diverse populations to demonstrate effectiveness? Um, were there multiple replications of the program? Further, were studies done by independent researchers, not just the developer or developers of the program? Finally, did studies of the program show significant and sustained side effects? Um, you want to consider that the data you're researching will show that impacts of the program were sustained at a minimum of six months post-program. Um, the second strategy to aid you in identifying where a program is on the continuum of confidence is by <coughs> utilizing a clearinghouse. Uh, you might be looking for an evidence-based prevention program for your community now or in the near future. We have listed several resources um, for you to note, along with the resources area of focus and the website. These registries can aid you in either reviewing the prevention programs you have or whether you wanna bring new programs that are appropriate for your particular youth in the community. Um, we do have highlighted here um, the Blueprints for Healthy, Young Develop Healthy Youth Development um, website as a premier rating source. Um, one thing I do wanna note is that when you're looking for programs, um, that they have a high rating in at least two registries of those that are mentioned. An important reminder as well is always to make sure that your PAYS data drives your prevention program selection for your community. You want to make sure that the program targets your community's prioritized risk and protective factors. You will find a table of PCCD funded programs and their targeted risk and protective factors available for downloading in today's um, Adobe Connect space. Also, please feel free to contact an epicenter, um, communities that care, or prevention coordinator for any assistance. So at this time, we'd like to afford you the opportunity to ask any questions. And we'd also like to take this opportunity to remind you that PCCD funds um, the LST and SFP 10 to 14 programs across the state, along with others. Um, you can visit the Epicenter website for additional information on these and other programs. Yeah, if, if you do have questions, please enter them in the chat bar on the uh, on your screen so we can see them and we'll address them in the order they come in. Yeah, while we're waiting for the uh, questions to come in, I just wanted to uh, to follow up on, on a couple of things you had heard uh, this year. Uh, PCCD, uh, my office is the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Uh, we put a, a funding out, uh, announcement out every year, uh, generally in late January, or early February, to support these evidence-based uh, programs, uh, SFP and LST being two of them. Uh, but there's a total of 14 different programs that we support. These are two-year grants uh, to really help you uh, implement the program well. Uh, and Epicenter does provide technical assistance for all of our funded grantees. Uh, additionally, uh, dealing with the Pennsylvania Youth Survey, we are starting to gear up for the 2017 administration. Uh, registration will begin uh, in early spring for that. And once again, I'd like to thank our partners at the Department of Education and the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs 
uh, as uh, those two agencies and PCCD will again offer the survey to any school district or private parochial charter um, cyber school that, that wishes to uh, take the survey at no cost. Uh, we'll provide you with the, the, the surveys, help you with the guide to administration, and then provide you a summary report in both electronic and in hard copy. Okay, so it looks like we've got a few questions coming in. Um, we see several folks, folks are typing questions as well. So we have a question, is the link to the NIDA link on effectiveness in the documents listed below? I, I don't think that it's in the documents below, but we do have it posted. Um, if you look at this current slide at the Epicenter Opioid Resources, that NIDA study is included in the links there. I know we have that section divided into um, areas for parents, for policymakers, as well as for service providers. I know that the NIDA link is in for the policymakers um, at least, and I think it may be in maybe the section for service providers as well. Um, there's a question about is the funding open for the two programs or is funding for the two programs open now? I think Jeff covered that. The funding announcements will open up early next year. When did you say? Late January, early February. Yeah. And will that include VPP and Sater? Uh, no, that'll be it. The funding stream will be called Violence Prevention Programs, uh, VPP. Um, and if you'd like to uh, be notified when it opens, uh, please visit the PCCD website. Uh, www.pccd.pa.gov and on the right hand side you'll see a link uh, that's labeled funding. Uh, click on that link and you'll see the opportunity to register your email so that every time PCCD opens a funding announcement you'll automatically get an email letting you know what that funding announcement is and who's eligible. Okay we have a question can Project Towards No Drug Abuse be approved for funding in an after-school community setting? And I, I know that um, it is the, the original research on TND uh, was not based in that setting. So I think we would have to understand a little bit more about what that project would be, what you would be proposing there um, to better understand whether we think that that uh, would be likely to have positive impacts for those youth. Um, it, it really will just depend on what the implementation plan looks like. Okay. Okay, we have uh, one from Lisa. Very few school districts in a county we serve participate in PAYS. That is a concern with regard to using PAYS to derive programming. Um, that uh, We do recognize that is a concern. Uh, the good news is that more and more districts are beginning to participate. Uh, this past uh, cycle in 2015, we had 356 of our 499 school districts participate. Um, so what I would suggest is if you want to uh, reach out to me, uh, G-K-O-L-C-H-I-N, Jeff Colchin at PA.gov. Um, we can assist you in uh, helping to convince your superintendents, your principals, your school board, school board whoever it may be, uh, to show them the value of the data. We can either come out uh, and do a presentation for them or share resources and help you do a presentation. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, it is people are realizing that in this time of, of limited resources, the more bang for your for the taxpayer dollar you can get, the better. And I think that's that's something that that if we can show using these proven effective programs based on the identified needs reported by your students, it it really does make a lot of sense to school boards and uh, school administrators that are trying to make these program decisions. And Lisa, um, I would also say that as it relates to these programs that we highlighted today. For strengthening families and life skills. Um, both of those programs are universal programs, so they're appropriate for all middle school audiences. So um, if you don't have data, that's okay. You can work on that with PCCD. And in the meantime, these programs are uh, would be relevant sort of uh, in any in any case. Um, so there there is that just something to think about. Um, so Matt, are there resources out there to help get this info right to the schools? Um, they're having problems getting schools to get away from one-time large assemblies that use scare tactics. <laughs> uh, you're happy we address this. Thank you for that. We find this is a, is a constant problem. Um, I would start by checking out the Opioid Resources website um, that we have listed here. 
Also, you could pull the um, effective, the, the fact sheet that we included in the share file section of the Adobe space. There is a two-page document, two pages front and back, that talks about effective programming, ineffective programming, and it also includes case studies around um, specific uh, programs that have been studied and shown to be harmful, as well as programs studied and shown to be effective. Um, you're absolutely welcome to reach out to us as well if you would like additional resources, and I would recommend um, grabbing that uh, Drug Free Action Alliance pamphlet. Um, that could also be a good way to start sharing, uh, sharing some of this knowledge. Okay. Okay. Emily, uh, is all VPP funding for implementing programs new to the school? If a school already has LST and SFP, is that school eligible for funding? Uh, generally, what PCCD does is fund startup programs with the idea that, that uh, after the two-year initial phase where all the curriculum is bought, all staff is trained, uh, we'll look to, to help uh, our funded grantees move into sustainability funding through another source. Uh, many uh, single county authority uh, uh, in the different counties, and in some cases, uh, the needs-based budget uh, are pot uh, potential candidates for sustaining those programs moving forward. But generally, we do not provide sustainability funding for programs that, that, that PCCD funds. Okay. We have a question about, do the two programs discuss fit well with Common Core standards at those grade levels? Um, I know that we've looked at mapping some of the programs that we support onto Common Core standards. Uh, I think we would have to look back and see. We could certainly, um, Becky, if you wanted to send your email to us, uh, just sort of send it privately to uh, the host, we can get back to you on that. Because I'm not entirely sure and I don't, we don't want to give you the wrong answer there. Okay. Uh, Teresa's follow-up question uh, on PTNDA. Um, Teresa, I would suggest uh, reaching out directly to, uh, to Epicenter. Uh, we can put you in touch with the, the program coordinator that, that handles PTNDA. Uh, and work with you to kind of determine uh, exactly what you have in mind and, and the most appropriate way that we might be able to fit into an after-school setting. Okay. Okay. Where, so where are the effective prevention handouts? So let's see. Did the files go away? They were. That's weird. Yeah. So are we looking to, I'm not sure, we're looking for our Adobe space where we had the files uploaded. Should be right here. Drag this back up. Sorry. Give us just a second. Oh. Ah. Ta-da! Can you see them now? <laughs> Sorry about that. Yep. We had to open the chat box a little too far and covered up the, the pod. Okay. What? Matt, thank you for that information about Common Core. That's good to know. That's it so far. Any other questions? You know, as we mentioned, this will uh, this will be archived and you can be able to download it. Uh, share the link with anyone you feel is appropriate. Uh, for our participant that, that had the question about educating the school, it might be nice to uh, share this with them, maybe uh, you know, hold a, a, a presentation or something like that. And again, Epicenter and PCCD would be more than happy to, uh, to work with you. Um, we do uh, go out to schools. We do speak to school boards or community coalitions, uh, uh, criminal justice advisory boards, any audiences that are interested in advancing prevention. We really believe that getting upstream and helping kids as early as possible is beneficial not only for them, but for their families and the community at large. So we are very vested in this effort in case you can't tell. So uh, we're happy to help you in any way that we're able to. And um, just as a reminder for those still um, listening, uh, please fill out the survey that will pop up once the webinar ends. Um, and again, if you'd like to be included on our mailing list, please share that information as well. And we thank you very much for your attendance today. Thanks, everybody.